All right, this is lesson number uh, two in the uh, series Understanding Your Religion, the seven major doctrines that define uh, Christianity. And this is uh, the, the name of this particular lesson is the writing of the Bible. And we're beginning with the uh, doctrine of inspiration. So this class is studying great Bible doctrines and I said last week that we're going to discuss seven of these, seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith. And the first doctrine uh, of that group is the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible itself, of course. But before I get to that, I want to mention that in case you were wondering because I mentioned you know, the seven major doctrines and if you noted there was no doctrine of the existence of God. You know, how can you be studying the major doctrines and there is no doctrine that you know, kind of argues the existence of God? Um, of course people, you know, they debate this in various ways, but in the Bible there's no body of doctrine or, or, or you know, proof, if you wish, or reasons to believe in the existence of a supreme being. Isn't that unusual in the Bible? You won't go to a chapter that'll say you know, six reasons to believe that God exists. You, know, you, you won't find that information in the Bible. And the reason for this is that um, the Bible assumes from the very beginning that God exists. It, it just assumes it. It doesn't argue it. It doesn't provide proof for it. It simply assumes that He exists. It says so from the very first sentence. You open the Bible, Genesis chapter one, and what does it say? In the beginning, God. So right away, it just assumes the existence of God from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. So the Bible states this idea as fact, and it doesn't contain you know, philosophical or theological arguments to prove it. So if, you're, if you ask me, what chapter in the Bible gives you all the arguments to prove that God exists? Well, there is no, you know, it's, it starts at the beginning, goes all the way to the end, assuming that God exists. Now, there are ways and there are systems of arguments that serve to prove the existence of a higher being. Uh, the existence of an all-powerful God, <clears throat> and these systems or these arguments are called apologetics. Apologetics, to make an apology, to make an argument for. But this is not the focus of our study. That's not what we're studying in this particular class. We are examining the actual doctrines or teachings that are specifically contained in the Bible. Uh, and I believe that a thorough knowledge of these will help us know in more detail the character and the work and the will of God, but not whether He exists or not. We have to kind of you know, take that as for granted from the very beginning. So in this context, it's natural to begin with a basic doctrine that is contained in the Bible, and that is its inspiration. Okay? So what does the Bible teach about itself? What is it about the Bible that makes it unique and separate from all other books and all other religious books, all other holy books? Well, we believe that the Bible teaches that it is unique and authoritative because it is directly inspired by God. That's what we believe about the Bible. Why do we believe that? Because the Bible teaches that about itself. Okay? You can't read the Bible without getting the idea that it, it is saying this is God's word. So that's a basic doctrine, that's a basic teaching of the Bible. So since the Bible is a book, I mean physically it's a book, we need to examine the history of writing and bookmaking before we look at the actual issue of inspiration. So this lesson today is a lot of nuts and bolts, okay, about the history of writing, so on and so forth, so we'll understand the context uh, of the doctrine of inspiration when we get to it. Now, a lot of people believe for a long time that early man was actually ignorant. And they rejected the idea that ancient civilizations used writing or writing materials. And this was their main argument against the authorship of Moses or Abraham who lived thousands of years before Christ. 
The argument was, well, it couldn't have been Moses that wrote this, it couldn't have been Abraham, it couldn't have been those the ancient people that wrote in the Bible because they didn't have writing in those days. They were ignorant. I mean, this, is, this was a classic argument from many, many, many years ago. However, we have learned several things about ancient writing and authors since then. For example, Egypt has inscriptions that date as far back as 3,000 years before Christ. Um, we have uh, King Sargon I, 2350 years before Christ. There are inscriptions referring to him. The point is, there's a lot of ancient writing that has been discovered, okay, that goes back hundreds and thousands of years before Christ. They have found letters written by Palestinian officials dating back 1500 years BC. That's approximately Moses' time. So as I said before, a lot of people discounted Moses as being the author of the first five books of the Bible, for example, because he lived too early for writing to have existed. That's a, an old argument against the inspiration of the Bible. However, modern findings have confirmed writing in early civilizations and the claim that the Bible makes that Moses wrote the beginning part of the Bible has now been justified. In other words, the Bible says that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible and now we have archeological evidence to demonstrate that writing existed during his time and even before his time. Okay? So you know, the, the, we shouldn't be afraid of modern research and we shouldn't be afraid of archeology span and so on and so forth because every time they make discoveries, the discoveries that they make simply confirm what the scriptures already say. As a matter of fact, the main textbook, the main resource book for archeologists to look for ancient cities and so on and so forth is the Bible because they're mentioned in, in the Bible itself when they are not mentioned in any other place. Okay, so let's take a look at, at very quickly here the history of writing materials used to make ancient books. So first we begin with stone, um, 1500 uh, BC. Uh, it was the earliest of writing materials, the Ten Commandments, right? 1500 BC. Uh, what were they on? They weren't on paper, they were the tablet. They were stone, stone tablets, which matches archaeological discoveries of the era. Uh, then came clay uh, in Assyria and Babylonia. This was used as their main writing materials. There are actually large libraries that have been discovered in modern times and, and the libraries all contain clay tablets. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 1, uh, Ezekiel lives about 600 years before Christ. God tells Ezekiel to write on a brick or a tablet. Again, the, the Bible is uh, in sync with the history of writing. Okay? Uh, then came wood, wooden tablets used during this time as well. We read in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 8, Isaiah uh, was writing on a, a tablet of wood. Some of these things existed at the same time. It's not that one period ended and then another period began, but these things you know, overlapped each other, just like we have different types of writing materials today. Uh, leather was an advancement. Uh, specially treated animal skins were marked upon using knives. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, uh, Paul says to Timothy, you know, bring my cloak and bring the parchments. The parchments he's talking about are uh, leather parchments, you know, things that were written on leather. And then there's papyrus. We're probably are all familiar with papyrus. Uh, many of us probably had to do some sort of project in high school or grade school you know, using uh, papyrus. Uh, great advances were made as the Egyptians developed papyrus as a writing surface. Uh, you probably know that papyrus was a plant that grew along the Nile River and inside the plant was a kind of a spongy material and this material was removed, it was cut into strips. The strips were laid side by side to form a, a sheet, you know, kind of, you know, what, uh, what do they call that, trestling? You know, one, one, one thing on top of another? Huh? Weaving, weaving there we go. They, they would weave the strips to create a sheet, uh, laid crosswise on top of it, 
and they were pressed together. Then they were dried and ready for use. Sometimes a sheet was used alone for a letter or a business receipt, and sometimes the sheets were attached together to form a scroll. So a scroll was about, or a roll if you wish, was about 30 feet long, about nine to 10 inches wide, the usual scroll. Writing was done on one side and a wooden roll pin was inserted for easy use. And we see this in movies, you know, old movies, people you know, rolling out, well, that's, that's, those are papyrus. Uh, these were the books of the ancient world referred to as scrolls. Uh, leather was used very much in the Old Testament. A lot of the Old Testament records that we have uh, were originally on leather. And with time, papyrus was used during the New Testament time. So a lot of the New Testament was written originally on papyrus. Then we had uh, something called a papyrus codex. Codex manuscript was used in the first and second century and these were merely single papyrus sheets that were put together in book form rather than rolls. So the codex form, when you see sometimes in your Bible, you see a reference to such and such codex you're wondering, what are they talking about? You know, this manus the codex manuscript, such H codex manuscript, whatever. Well, it's simply, that was the beginning of the book form, putting these sheets together. Then there was something called vellum codex, very interesting. This uh, development was important because most New Testament manuscripts from the fourth to the 14th century were written on this type of material, the vellum codex. And an interesting development, you know the necessity is the mother of invention? Well, this is what happened to develop the vellum codex. In the late first century, a certain king named Eumenes uh, uh, II of Pergamum, which was in Asia Minor, wanted to build a world-class library. And that was fine, he had the money to do it, and so on and so forth. One problem, the king of Egypt, for some reason, tried to prevent this by cutting off his papyrus supply, because the papyrus came from Egypt. So this forced the king to develop newer forms of writing materials. There's where the necessity is, the mother of invention idea comes through. And he did this by improving the process of treating animal skins, which had been used for hundreds of years. In other words, he took an old technology, the, the vellum, you know, the skins, and he improved that old technology in order to build his library. What he did was he dried and he processed by rubbing with smooth stones calf skin. That's why it's called vellum, veal, or antelope skin, you know, better skin. The main value of this new process, aside from beauty, because some of these were dyed purple and they were written on with gold lettering, one of the main purpose, or one of the main advantages is that they lasted much longer. They had you know, a longer shelf life, if you wish. Papyrus was easy to use, it was thin, so on and so forth, but it was dry and it would deteriorate quickly. So two of the most valuable copies of the New Testament manuscripts that still exist today were written on vellum, for the skin, and codex, book form, um, uh, to, uh, to this day. So that's another form of writing material. Now we're really getting into, whoops, sorry, anyways. Uh, the next one is uh, paper, of course. Paper was invented in the Orient in the 13th and 14th century AD, spread westward from there. The printing press, movable type, and the printing press invented in 1448 by Gutenberg. And the first book printed on the printing press, of course, was the Bible. Mm -hmm. Latin Vulgate, actually. And that original Bible still exists, the first one. It's in a museum in Gutenberg, uh, in, uh, in Frankfurt, right? excuse me, in Frankfurt, in Germany. Uh, a little anecdote, a little factoid, interesting when I was doing research on this, was that Gutenberg, you know, he was a businessman. He printed the, the Bible, but I mean, he was in the business of printing, right? He was a goldsmith originally. And uh, the bank seized his printing presses for lack of payment, and they threw him into debtor's jail, and he died in jail. 
You know the old story, no, no good deed goes unpunished. You know? So here's the guy who prints the very first Bible you know, to launch you know, the modern era of printing and his reward is that he spends the rest of his uh, days in, in a debtor's prison because he couldn't pay for the, for the presses. Very, very sad uh, story. I'm sure that he's gone on to his reward. And then of course we get to the communication age. Printing remained the main communication technique for centuries, but with time, of course, electronic communication became predominant, beginning with uh, telegraph. We forget about telegraph. We think it's such an old thing, but it's fascinating how telegraph, modern telegraph was developed. You know, Marconi, if you read the story of Marconi, that guy was like a rock star in his age. You know, very rich you know, and very powerful and a genius and so on and so forth. You know, so it starts with the telegraph and it goes on with the telephone, radio, TV, internet. Now we have voice recognition. I mean, could you imagine? You couldn't even imagine such a thing. Now uh, Microsoft's developing a type of um, voice recognition software where you not only talk, now we have that on our phones, right, for texting, uh, you know, hi mom, how are you? I'll be at your house at nine o'clock and you look at it and it's, hi John. <laughs> I'll, be your house, I'll be at your house with a pineapple. You know, but I mean, <laughs> voice recognition, you know, they're, they're improving it all the time. Well now they're working on voice recognition software that not only recognizes your voice and, and, and puts it into print, but recognizes your voice and translates it into any language that you want. And it translates it not only into any language that you want, but it translates it using your voice. So you're speaking in English and you, want, you have a pen pal or a friend that lives in Germany. You speak in English and it translates it into German using your voice and the person at the other end receives it, hearing your voice in their language. What does that sound like? What biblical idea comes to mind? Pentecost, right. They're almost at the point of reproducing the miracle, because it was a miracle at Pentecost. They're almost at the point of reproducing that miracle now using today's technology. And I'm digressing a little bit, but can you imagine using this technology to preach the gospel? Can you imagine what we, what we will be able to do and how, what the, you know, the spread that we'll able to have? I know Hal and I are following this very closely. You know, imagine if Bible talk with 1,300 pieces of information, videos and so on and so forth, if we could translate all of that into any language that we wanted. Right now, Lise is translating one of my books, uh, Colossians for Beginners, and it takes her weeks, months to translate it. And then uh, Merle Gatewood, uh, Hal's uh, mom, who's a professor of uh, literature and French, she goes over and you know, it takes these two women months to do one, and this will be done you know, in a couple of hours. So great technology, boy, and you know, it can be used for great things, and we're, we're very excited about it. Anyways, so, you know, communication age is moving forward. So in our study of, of writing and ancient writing materials, we need to realize that when it comes to the Bible, God did not always communicate with man through the written word. In other words, God's communication with man predates writing. So in the beginning, God communicated with man orally. He spoke to Adam, for example, in Genesis 1.28, spoke to Noah. There was no written communication. He spoke directly to Noah, Genesis 6.13. He spoke to Abraham, Genesis 17. Only later did God instruct man, meaning Moses, to begin recording his instructions. See what I'm saying? So at the beginning, God speaks to man, and then when we get to the time of Moses, God now begins to instruct man to write down what he says so that what he says to man can now be disseminated to other men. Okay? So the story of the recording of the Bible as a written record is the story of God's communication to man. So the origin of the Bible, the word Bible comes from a Greek word, biblia, which means simply books. The complete Bible or books, number 66, 39 in the Old Testament, 39 books, 27 books in the New. To study Bible origin, we must begin with the Old Testament or a better word to use or a better term is the Old Covenant. 
This term is very useful because it helps us understand what the Bible actually is. What is it? Yes, we believe it's inspired, but what is it? So what is it? Well, it's the detail of two covenants or agreements between God and man. The old one and the new one, which replaces the old. A little bit like a lease. You have a lease for a house, it has certain conditions, the rent, no pets, you know, whatever. And then the lease is up, we sign a new lease, and there are changes made in the lease. Well, there's the old covenant, and then there's the new covenant. Old Testament, New Testament, same idea, okay? So um, we begin with the Old Testament, the origin of the Old Testament. Our study of the Bible requires us to understand several features of the Old Testament. It was written in the Hebrew language, which is still in use today in Israel. The first man charged with actually recording events and communication from God was Moses, 1500 BC. In Exodus 24, he receives the words of the covenant on Sinai. Exodus 34, the Ten Commandments. Moses credited with writing and organizing the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. Okay. The, 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 the four, you know, uh, aside from Genesis, the, the other four books, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those books we know Moses because he mentions himself, he mentions the, you know, the time that he lived, so we know Genesis, he writes uh, through uh, the oral histories and the written histories that come down through the patriarchs, he puts those together. He's the, he's the assembler, if you wish, or the editor of the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, this is mentioned in Joshua chapter 8, verse 31, and also Jesus confirms this in John 7, verse 19, when Jesus says, did not Moses give you the law? Okay. So Jesus confirms that Moses is the one that gave the written law, the written material to the Jews. So once God began to use human beings to record His words, this system continued after Moses. So who is after Moses? Well, Joshua is the next writer after Moses. We read about this in Joshua 24. And then the prophets record their history and their prophecies after Joshua. You read about that in Nehemiah chapter eight verse 18. So in this way, over a period of 1500 years, approximately 28 writers completed 39 books of what we call the Old Testament. Malachi was the last prophet to record in 516 BC. No other prophets, no other inspired writings until we get to John the Baptist. I'm not saying that John the Baptist had any writings, but until his time until John the Baptist comes on to the scene. And all these books in the Old Testament were collected and assembled together into one volume by 400 BC. And so that means that the Jews had a complete Bible, because they considered their work the Bible. They had a complete Bible by 300 years before Christ. So what we're reading you know, in our Old Testament, the Jews had this material, exact material, 300 years before Jesus. Uh, interesting thing is how the Jews organized it, a little different than what we do. They had the same material as we do, but they organized it differently. For example, they divided it into three main sections. There was the law, which included the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books, Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy. This was of highest importance to them. The Sadducees, for example, only accepted the first five books. That's all they went with. They discounted the prophets and all that. They didn't, you know, they didn't believe in that. Whereas the Pharisees, they, they, you know, they believed the, the law, but they also accepted the prophets and so on and so forth. And that was the, the debate between the two. Anyways, you had the law, first five books. You had the prophets. So you had the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, each had their own volume. And then you had the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and the 12 uh, minor prophets. All of those were in one volume. So that's how they divided. Uh, 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 the law, the prophets, former and latter, and then the holy writings, the poetry and the history, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Esther to Nehemiah, Daniel, so on and so forth. That's how they 
broke it down. They organized these into 24 books instead of our usual 39 books. Okay? So you had the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, five books. The prophets, former and latter, four former, four latter. Okay? Remember, when you're talking about the latter prophets for the Jewish Old Testament, you're talking about they consider the 12 minor prophets, that was one book. Okay? That was one book. That's how you get the, the number. So you've got the former and the latter, and then you've got the writings, poetry and history, 11 books. Five plus four plus four plus 11, 24 books. So today, we have exactly the same books, but we divide them differently. Today, we have the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, five books. We have history, Joshua to Esther, 12 books. We have poetry, Job to Song of Solomon, five books. We have the major prophets, Isaiah to Daniel, five books. We call them major prophets because their books are long, that's all. It's not because they're more important, they just have longer books. And then we have the minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi, 12 books. So five plus 12 plus five plus five plus 12, 20, uh, 39, 39 books. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in addition to these inspired books, the Jews wrote and circulated other books that were about the Bible, but were not inspired by God. Okay? So more books were produced that were not inspired, but were about the Bible. For example, you had the Talmud. And of course, we always confuse the Talmud and the Torah. Okay? Not to be confused with the Torah. The Torah means the law. So when you're talking about the Torah, you're talking about the law of God. When you're talking about the Talmud, the Talmud was a body of Jewish writing that interpreted the Old Testament. In other words, it was a commentary. Okay? It contained more than one commentary. It contained several commentaries on the Old Testament called the Mishnah and the Midrash. All right, it gets a little confusing. So you have the Talmud, and within the Talmud you have two commentaries, the Mishnah and the Midrash, as well as many legal and social writings about Jewish life and social practices at the time. So it's, you know, the, the, the Talmud has a lot of different things. I remember taking a, a class at, um, uh, in U at university in Montreal that was taught by a rabbi on the Old Testament. <clears throat> and he said, one of, the, one of his opening statements were, if I was stuck on a desert island somewhere, you know, and uh, I could only bring one book, uh, uh, the only book that I would bring, and I thought for sure, well, it would be the Bible. It would be at least the Jewish Bible, the Jewish scriptures. You know? He said, no, no, he said, because he said, what, what do you think it would be? And people, you know, he said, no, I'd bring the Talmud with me. That's the only book I'd bring. Well, I have to remember, he's a Jew. He's a modern Jew on top of that. So the Talmud contained a lot of various information about Jewish life and how to apply uh, the scriptures in daily life. Then there are the um, apocryphal books, apocryphy, hidden meaning hidden books. These were non-inspired religious books. Um, a lot of the end time ideas that people have, these ideas about what will happen at the end of the world, a lot of it comes from these books. Uh, today we call it science fiction. You know, kind of like science fiction. Uh, the book of Esdras or the book of Judith or the book of Maccabees, for example, the Maccabean period, you know, about 100 years or so before Christ, the revolt of the Maccabees when Greek life was overtaking Jewish life, when Greek philosophy and language was overtaking Jewish and Hebrew language and culture, the Maccabees stood up and said, you know, they, 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 they defended the land. 
when the uh, Syrian king Epiphanes uh, tried to uh, 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 disallow circumcision and worship uh, in order to control Judea, the Maccabees, that's a family, they rose up, they were rebels, they were fighters, and they fought against uh, the, uh, the hold that the north, northern country of Syria and uh, the king had over the land, and they were heroes. And so you have the writings of that time, the Maccabean period and the, the book of Maccabees. And uh, they're not inspired writings, but there's so much information in there about what went on between Malachi and John the Baptist, those years in between. The only reference that we have are these books that were written. So they're not inspired, but they're contemporary. We have an idea of what's going on during that four century period. And then we have Josephus, Flavius Josephus, he was a Pharisee and um, he was a historian. And he uh, wrote the history, he was writing about contemporary history during the time of Jesus. And so as a Pharisee, he was not a Christian, he, never, he was not converted, he writes about Jesus. He writes about Christianity. He writes about the early church as a phenomenon taking place within Jewish society, but he's writing as a non-believer. He's writing as a Jew, okay? So it's from Josephus that we find out that James, you know, James, the author of the epistle, James, you know, it's from Josephus that we find out that James was killed by being thrown off the wall the Jews took him and they threw him down from the wall around the city. And it's from Josephus we find out that he wasn't dead yet when he, when he hit the ground some, I don't know how, 100 feet up. So they went down and they finished him off by stoning him. So we, the Bible doesn't contain that information, but Josephus contains that information. So we have a lot of information about early Christianity from uh, Josephus. So when we read the Old Testament, we're reading the same books that the Jews read at the time. We're reading the exact same books that Jesus and the apostles read and taught from. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. All right, so there's our little introduction, if you wish, to the, uh, to the books. Uh, yeah, there's um, uh, the introduction to the, uh, just the history of writing. Next week uh, we'll uh, show you uh, how to divide the entire Old Testament into 10 periods and we're going to look at the New Testament books, how they were put together and what criterion was used to decide which books were supposed to fit into the New Testament canon. How did they decide which books were inspired and which, weren't, which were not inspired? There was a decision made, there was a criteria used. Okay? All right, so that's it for this time.